another edition of Turned Out a Punk. I'm your host, Damian Abraham, and once again, I'm bringing you a conversation with someone who grew up listening to punk, may or may not still be involved with punk, but had their life changed by the genre in a major way. And today on the show, huge guest, Michelle Zahner of Japanese Breakfast and of also the incredible, unbelievably heavy, but really phenomenal book, Crying in H Mart, uh, that came out this past year as well. More on that in one second, but this is a, a very interesting conversation with a, a like a Bo Jackson, truly someone that's doing it in two different fields at the same time. But more on that in one second. But first, if you would like to get in touch with me, head over to the email address turned out a punk podcast at gmail.com. That is run by my brother and show producer and guest booker extraordinaire. Tristan Abraham, and he will get the message to me. You can also find me on Twitter and Instagram at left for Damien. And if you want to support the show, the best way to support the show is just by telling all your friends about it and letting everyone know that you enjoy this podcast that we do each and every week over here. You can also subscribe to it and rate it on iTunes or wherever you're listening to it. And thank you. Thank you to the people that do. I really do appreciate it. Thank you very much. Uh, and speaking of thanks, uh, we got to give a huge thank you to everyone that heads over to patreon.com slash turned out of punk and supports the show that way. I just posted uh, a bunch of stuff over there, including video versions of the recent Tommy end episode, as well as the Zach Blair episode. There's some other cool stuff on that thing as well. So check it out and thank you to everyone that has already done so. And speaking of thanks, this thing would not be possible without the kind, loving support of the fine folks at Vans who came aboard a few years ago and said, Damien, do what you do. Just don't do it out of your own pocket and we will help you cover the costs. And they really have. And uh, it would not be possible to do this because there are uh, a surprising number of costs with doing this podcast. So thank you very much to Vans for doing that. Check out all the stuff they're doing over there on Channel 66. They've done some great stuff with uh, past guests of the show. You know, some of the actually a lot of past guests of the show are resident DJs. And they've got a lot of cool guests doing live things. And yeah, so check out that stuff. And House of Vans will hopefully be back. House of Vans were these pop-up parties that Vans used to do all over the place. And occasionally I get to go out there and do a live podcast. And I miss that. But hopefully it will be back. And speaking of being back, my band Fucked Up is going back on tour. And uh, hopefully we will see you out there. First of all, we're going out with Faith No More for a few shows. And well, as well as Riot Fest, you can find those up at fucked up.cc or you just google faith not faith no more slash fucked up you know whatever plus fucked up it'll come up you'll find it um and i look forward to playing those shows what a, what a weird thing to get to say i'm going on tour with faith no more and then later on in january and february and into march and april fucked up will be doing david comes to life live We'll be going around, uh, you know, kind of the East Coast, the West Coast, and over to England, Ireland, and Scotland as well. So check local listings for those shows. I look, I cannot tell you how forward I look to playing shows again and seeing people and talking to people. Come out of those shows. It'll be like a live turned into punk kind of just one-on-one. You can talk to me after the show and we can just nerd out about this stuff and, and bring, yeah, just bring yourself uh, you're probably wondering my vo- why my voice sounds kind of messed up right now. I spent the whole day recording and uh, kind of shredded my voice, but I'm, I'm here. I'm here to bring you an incredible episode with my new friend, Michelle Zahner. Now, Michelle Zahner, I've been a fan of since her old band, Little Big League, and to really watch in this last year as she has kind of been discovered by a much larger audience has been something incredible to see happen. Shout out to my buddy Aloy for reaching out and, and setting up this episode uh, with Tristan because it's, it's amazing to get to talk to her. You know, Michelle performs currently under the name Japanese breakfast. She released uh, a phenomenal new record this year called Jubilee. She also wrote a great new book that I strongly recommend reading. It is incredibly heavy and uh, really, 
you know, just a really honest book about grief, you know, and a really beautiful uh, kind of tribute to her, to her family and stuff and to her mom, especially. Um, it's called Crying in H Mart and you can pick it up everywhere now. And I, I recommend you do. If you've lost someone, like I lost my mom a couple years ago, as I'm sure many of you listening know, and it, it hits, it, it really hurts. And it, it's something that, um, huh, it just doesn't seem to go away ever. You know, and that's a good thing. You don't want it to really go away. I mean, you know, you got over it and you're never going to get over it. And that's, that's reasonable. Um, but it gets easier as time goes on and reading stuff like this now, I find, I find it really powerful and I strongly recommend, you know, checking this thing out. Uh, I'm not going to ramble on anymore. Sit back, relax, and enjoy Japanese breakfast on Turned Out a punk. Michelle, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. Well, as I was just telling you off air, I'm like a, I, I was a fan of Little Big League. And so to watch, you know, you kind of, you know, become this massive songwriter appreciated by a much larger audience, especially in the last year, has been incredible to see happen. So it's an honor to have you here on the show. Oh, thank you so much. Well, I got to start this off, though, the way they all start off, which is, Michelle, how did you get into punk? Do you remember the first time you ever came across the genre? Oh, um, I feel like uh, I've lived my life as a punk poser uh, for a long time, you know? <laughs> like, <laughs> Same. I, Same I will here. Say, I will say, uh, here's, here's a great way to begin. My introduction to punk was probably like Avril Lavigne when I was like mm -hmm. in... Uh, I was, I guess, in like fifth or sixth grade. And, you know, I don't know how much, I mean, she's obviously a plant. Uh, but, you know, I, I was thinking about it. And I think that there is actually like a lot of like millennial gals that maybe were more influenced by Avril Lavigne than a lot of us want to admit to. And I think that part of it is like she was the first mainstream woman that I saw with a guitar, you know, like that was like wild for me. And if you don't have any siblings and your parents uh, don't raise you around cool music, I feel like, you know, the radio or MTV was like how you found that stuff. So I remember, Absolutely. yeah, like I remember seeing Avril Lavigne on like MTV, the complicated video and being like, I, I want to be a a punk like I want to not I want to like fuck with mall cops and like <laughs> wear wristbands and like studded belts and that kind of shit so I feel like my introduction to punk was this like very commercial fake mass market you know package uh that was created for young kids to like get into quote unquote punk and honestly that is that was my sort of introduction to punk and like I, I I don't know I was just saying earlier that I feel I felt like a poser because I I honestly don't I don't think that I listen to that much punk music uh, I never really got into it but I certainly am inspired and influenced by the ethos and um, have a lot of punk friends and community that I'm supported by and so it, it I, I don't know I like I do feel like it has a special place in, in my heart. Well, it's amazing you bring up Avril Lavigne because I think, <laughs> you know, no, it, I mean, and I mean, seriously, because she is um, being from Toronto, like when that phenomena was kind of happening, it was very much like happening here in Toronto, like Napanee's really close, relatively speaking. And um, but she was like, it was like you're saying an incredible on ramp. And those are really like when you look back throughout punk history and punk is ultimately in the very beginning, like when it's really codified and defined as being punk, it's a really commercial fabricated genre mm. out of the gate. Yeah. Um, but Avril Lavigne was someone who was this kind of great on ramp for, for a whole generation of kids that wind up doing it, DIY and independent music. And you need those mainstream blips to happen in order to kind of replenish the pool for the next wave of creativity. That's going to kind of come out of this thing. Sure. Yeah. What, what do you think uh, came out of that? <laughs> well, I, guess, I think tons of yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
I, I think like you're saying, like, I think, I think there's, there's probably a lot of people that that was their first exposure. Like, I think you could definitely make a strong argument that there are more kids that were exposed to straight edge by Avril uh, Lavigne Xing up and talking about it than they were by Ian MacKay. Well, yeah, that's true. And I feel like there's a bunch of girls that picked up the guitar after watching someone like Avril Lavigne. Oh, definitely. Yeah. And, and her band were all people from local Toronto punk bands and screamo. Really? Yeah. Like, uh, Mark London, um the other guitar player who she went out with for a while too were both in the band closet monster uh there was a member of grade in the band for a while there was so she kind of had like this sort of you know and it was it was definitely you know something that was conceived on a certain level by people in the music industry but it was also really authentic because she was really this person really doing this thing and really singing these songs so it was real, you know, like, that. I, I don't know. Avril Lavigne is someone who I have a, a lot of empathy for. Yeah. Um, and a lot of uh, appreciation for now. You should have her on the podcast. I would love to. I'd hear love it. to. Like, that's like the <laughs> perfect. I would love to know what punk means to Avril Lavigne. There's, I, I remember a Rolling Stone interview back then where she talked about Dillinger 4 and how Whoa. Dillinger 4. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So cool. I think I think I think she would definitely be into stuff. She did put out that video yesterday. I saw on the internet. Oh, with Tony her, Hawk, her yeah. first her first TikTok. <laughs> her first TikTok, and what a way to make an entrance to TikTok. I know, but like it's also so geeky that you like plan your first TikTok <laughs> like to be this like weird. I don't know publicity stunt. <laughs> I wonder if they're friends or if everything about that is just you know for the TikTok. Uh, I feel like everything about that is just for the TikTok, but I feel bad because I also have a lot of empathy for Avril and I, I don't want to shit on her at all. Yeah. Yeah. No, I imagine that would have been an incredibly rough go just as to be a young person growing up at that time in the music industry, you know, it just, you know, especially as a young woman growing up at that time in the music industry. Yeah. And I feel like, you know, she burst open a really thorny dialogue about, punk and being a poser and an industry plan and all that kind of stuff but it's kind of cool because i mean she wrote a lot i mean i i'm pretty sure that she wrote m most of those songs and because uh, i know she writes like pop songs for other people she does have a musical background like a legitimate musical background yeah no she was definitely and well she can sing too right all those songs like those are those are incredible performances yeah this, big this is the most i've ever talked about avril lavigne <laughs> <laughs> I, I I was on a music video with her one time. No, too. wait, yeah, what? Really, what? Yeah, there's a, Have you seen her? Have you heard of the band Trouble Charger? No, from Canada. No, you're not alone in not hearing about. <laughs> they were a, they were a, a band that was very popular here in the '90s, and the lead singer Greg Nori was the producer and kind of co-writer of a lot of the early Sum 41 songs. Oh, cool. And so they put out a record, and they had. Derek from Sum 41 and Dave from Sum 41 and Avril Lavigne and then the guys from Gob and a bunch of other people in the music video. And I was down there with some friends for that day and spent the day hanging out with, with Avril Lavigne and all these random people. Did you talk to her at all? Yeah. Oh, she was she... super. Sorry, go on. Oh, that's awesome. You talked to Avril Lavigne. Yeah. Yeah. She was really like, it was just when I think Skater Boy had come out, but oh it was my like, God. you know, like a, that one, two punch of those two songs kind of coming out. Yeah. And she, you know, she was super young and just kind of like, you know, taking it all in and getting into this stuff and definitely, you know, acting punk. But at the same time, like, you know, Dave from some 41 was just on the podcast and was telling me that the record label encouraged them to do all sorts of crazy antics to come across punk in the media. So I imagine she was kind of getting the same directives from the record label. Wow. <laughs> the record label is just like, you know what would be fun? <laughs> Wear a tie with an yeah, undershirt. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> where where did you kind of go from Avril Lavigne, though, uh, in terms of getting into music? That's a good question. Um, I feel like after Avril Lavigne, I, I feel like I went through this phase where, like, I truly, I feel like kind of a late bloomer. And I blame my parents, honestly, because, like, my dad was just out to lunch in general. My mom was, like, an immigrant, so she didn't really know about, like, American, I don't know, like, cool American counterculture. Uh, so, yeah, I, I remember having this moment where I was like, I want to be the kind of person who is into music. 
And I'm trying to think if this came before or after Avril Lavigne. I, I feel like... I feel like maybe it was around the same. There was a period of time that was like a really misguided journey to like classic rock because I was like, this is what people who like, this is like objectively good music. Uh, <laughs> and so like I got a bunch of like Led Zeppelin and like Janis Joplin, Jimi Hendrix, Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young like CDs. And I was just like, I'm it. I'm a music guy. <laughs> 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 and then... Uh, Thankfully, that didn't last very long. And I think maybe like eighth, I don't know, maybe like high school, I like started kind of actually forming a, a music taste of my own. And a lot of it was rooted in Pacific Northwest indie rock uh, because I grew up in Eugene, Oregon. So bands like Built a Spill, Modest Mouse, Elliot Smith, uh, Granddaddy. And then there were also like K Records bands like Beat Happening and Mount Erie slash the Microphones, Kimmy and Dawson. And then like, I feel like there was like this sort of anti-folk movement that like was kind of inspired by this punk ethos or like DIY. And that's like when I felt really hard for, I started playing music because like DIY was like this really inviting window in. And also like La Tigre was like a big thing. Where were you kind of hearing about this stuff? Because, you know, once again, it's not really necessarily played on the radio. It's not like classic rock where it's, you know, as canonized at that point. I guess just through friends, like there was a venue in Eugene called the Wow Hall that I would just beg my mom to let me go to uh, on the weekends. And yeah, I had a friend, uh, my best friend's like mom was sort of younger and had some CDs that we got into. I can't really remember what they were now, but uh yeah mostly just like through through friends and going to shows and like getting into it that way it's amazing when you kind of think about you know and, it, and you're like you're saying it all is stuff that kind of comes out of punk rock like elliot smith was in punk bands like right you know it, it's it's amazing how prolific the music scenes of the pacific northwest are and i know it's kind of storied and 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 especially at this point, you know, about how the fact that no bands went there on tour and that's why these scenes were able to kind of grow in the way they were. But, you know, you look at the late nineties into the early two thousands, like you mentioned, there's just so much stuff and it's almost like they're all kind of little separate scenes. Yeah. Yeah. It is cool. I feel like, um, yeah, <laughs> it's cool. Yeah. I, I just like, I don't know. It's so, it's such a, I love going there for the first time. It just felt like, this is uh <laughs> like I could see why K Records is here. I can see why, you know, they're they're uh, Kill Rock Stars is here. I can see why this scene these scenes exist. Yeah, and I think maybe because uh yeah, I mean I, I feel like it's like really rooted in DIY too, or like just if if bands aren't coming here or touring here, or like you know also it, touring on the West Coast is so different from touring on the East Coast because like if you live in New York or Philly it's easy to tour to like Boston, DC, like all, all of these places. Cause they're all like two to four hours away from each other. If you're touring on the West coast, all of the cities are like four to eight hours away, mm -hmm. you know? And so I feel like you do kind of like, maybe that's some part of like these communities kind of like coming up with these weird sort of micro genres and, and, you know, tight knit scenes. Yeah. It's like, I guess it's that isolation. You don't have that, the same constant influence from outside so it's kind of like you're cut off so it grows differently in terms of the the way i guess the the the, the music tree kind of blossoms yeah and like it's not like la or new york where there's like there could be just like some label or journalist or important person uh to like help kickstart your career like it's just probably not going to happen for you so you're just doing it because i, I don't know you're just it, it's like more on the ground or something <laughs> No, that's, that's a hundred percent. I found that like, you know, it's, it's interesting when like, you know, especially like in Toronto, cause there was such a music scene. It's, you don't really have the development of the hardcore scene like you do in other places because there is the possibility that if you're in a new wave band, you could get signed, you know? And I think, you know, it kind of is always there as a presence. So yeah, it, it, it will impact your sound a little bit, even if you're rejecting it, it's impacting your sound. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because I was just thinking, like, growing up in the Pacific Northwest, I wasn't really exposed to that much punk and hardcore. And I feel like when I went, like, I know that there's, like, a whole, like, 
Bay Area and like LA, like punk scene. But like in the Pacific Northwest, like is there, are there like punk bands that are associated with that region? Because like I remember when I went to Philly, like realizing that like hardcore had like a huge influence on that city, and all of my band members in in Little Big League were majorly influenced by punk and hardcore bands. Yeah, like I guess historically there was definitely, but like it's it, it's it's you're it's very different how it's taken up. Like even I'm trying to think of like the biggest bands I can think of, you know, that I was super into was that band Sexvid from Olympia, and mm. they were a hardcore band, but they were playing with like, you know, uh, they were playing with 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 all sorts of weird noise bands, or like they were playing with milk music, or they were playing with um, gun outfit. You know, they weren't necessarily playing with like capital H hardcore bands either. So mm -hmm. yeah, I think you're right. Like it is, it's, it's just taken up differently kind of the whole way through. Yeah. I feel like we're too like sensitive over there. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, right. It's too yeah. rainy to get angry. <laughs> I think it's also like the the politics that that yeah, is so ingrained yeah, in totally. a lot of punk rock. Oh, too. totally. Like so much of punk comes out of DC because there's like you're right at the heart of like where anger begins. Yeah, and but then also like by the you know, it's out of the Pacific Northwest that you also have that sort of like real evergreen college, like totally, really kind yeah. of like politically informed that's true. branch coming in too. Yeah, it's fascinating. I, I that's what I love. And I think that's changed because you don't have to have that regional focus anymore. Yeah. But like, I love that regional identity that music used to have. Yeah. I mean, I, th I think that it still does. Um, but yeah, maybe not as much as, as it used to, or like, it's just more broad now. Cause like so many people have access to like getting exposure. Like it's, you know, it's more even. Yeah. Like I just feel it's not, it, yeah, it's not as constrained by, geographical you know like you don't have to rely on just the kids that are shopping at the record store near you you can you can meet a whole swath of people that are into the exact same sort of music totally. that you're into yeah all over the world yeah uh, where what was the first concert you went to <laughs> um uh rafi <laughs> a great first start <laughs> i was like two no i was like maybe five or something i brought like uh i was like at the holt center in eugene oregon but like first proper concert, hmm. I can't, the one that like leaves an impression on me is I saw Built to Spill at the Crystal Ballroom and that was like pretty formative, but it, that couldn't have been my, my first show, I don't think. They, they are an incredible band. They're and so once good. again, like a band that, you know, connects back to punk too yeah do do that <laughs> yeah they have they have like uh i'm trying to look it up but like uh, there's a there's a couple members that played in old hardcore bands and old punk bands back in the day and i, I, I remember, believe it and i remember playing a show with them one time oh that's awesome and, and just what right yeah one of those things where you're just randomly talking to someone backstage that you're a fan of and wind up talking about something like you never expected i think we we're talking about like black flag lineups or something <laughs> really weird that's sick. He seems like such a nice man, Doug March. Carry the Zero yeah. is like the first song I learned how to play on the guitar. And we're like slated to play with them at Tree Fort in Boise. Uh, and I'm excited to to meet him because like, I don't know. I mean, it just seemed impossible being in a band back then watching him. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's it's a uh, it's wild like when you get to get to a point where these people that were heroes become kind of peers. It's wild. It's completely wild. That's like happened a lot this year of like talking to my heroes in this weird way. It's kind of what I live for. Like, I know I'm never going to get rich off being in the band, but at least I'll get a chance to meet all the people that I've always wanted to meet. T totally. Or at least to just like be like within that, like have your mind considered amongst like your heroes. I think it's amazing. Yeah. Like to be able to walk into a room and talk to them and, and, and just, you know, like, yeah, conversing with them on, that sort of like uh colleague kind of level. yeah there's part of me that's into it and i'm part part of me like just is not into it at all like i like that kind of there's part of me like that wishes i could keep that mystery of just like being so blown away by it. like like a someone like the unreal nature of of someone i like i kind of got rushed into like meeting too many of my heroes this year i think 
And like now I'm kind of scared and I, I need it to like kind of <laughs> like calm down a little bit. I think. Yeah. Well, it could be, uh, you know, they're, they're definitely the odd time that you meet someone you're like, ah, sometimes it's really this. disappointing. Like, you know, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I'd really rather not uh, sometimes but for the most part, it's been really great, but uh, sometimes I, I wish it didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's the other risk that you have when you kind of start meeting these people is that the, uh, there is almost like people were protected by the mystique in a lot of ways. And, and a lot of these people are kind of like, I don't know. Their 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 art is way more impressive than they are as human beings. Totally, or like they're just like shy and not down, you know. Like, uh, and it's hard to not like judge them, even though that's like t a totally okay thing, you know. Some people, some like artists are like really easy to talk to, and they're really warm and open, and some aren't, and like it's hard to not like hold it against them, even though it's like not their fault, and that's like probably what part of what makes their art really good, you know. Yeah, I, I I always wondered if there's like some sort of what well, kind of you know just from talking to people over the years, there's almost like these certain things that motivate someone to be wanting to get up on stage, and and expose themselves like that. And it's like a it, you know it's, it's certain types of insecurities and there's certain types of things that I guess motivate people. And a lot of times it's certain personality types, and and one of them tends to be someone who's otherwise very shy and mm -hmm. needs this as a expression outlet yeah it's 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 a weird uh <laughs> it's very weird like realizing how universal some of these fears are yeah i mean we're all just like walking meat bags <laughs> feeling <laughs> yeah. so when did you start playing music right you didn't start till you were in college uh i started playing music when i was 16. what was your first band um oh god it was like um like an acoustic solo folk project that was really bad that was basically like a kimya dawson really cringy ripoff um did you play live yeah 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 i i played like acoustic guitar live and i and i just loved um i loved all of that like admin part of it you know like i loved like the whole thing like i just i loved booking shows and i loved promoting shows and i loved like all the stuff that goes into like running a band that you're like not really supposed to like, I guess. Uh, I, I really loved that part of it. Um, and so that was kind of the beginning. And then uh, I had a band with my ex-boyfriend called the Tiffany Lambs. That was like this kind of fanciful avant-garde, like Rhodes piano duo situation. And then what did I do? Then I had a band in college there was like a girl band called Post Post. And then it was a little big league and then Japanese breakfast. You know, it's funny you brought that admin stuff and finding the joy in doing that. There was an artist here and I wish I could remember their name now, but uh, years ago they did like an entire, uh, you know, gallery show around the idea of doing the admin as the art and how that is actually like when you look at, the breakdown in work oh yeah it's it. like 80 percent. <laughs> exactly yeah. yeah and so really that's what you're doing like if you're good at that <laughs> that's 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 more than half the battle totally i just like i'm really lucky that i like that lifestyle you know like mm. i love i love like loading out you know like I truly, like i love breaking down drums and putting them into their cases <laughs> and clipping them in. I love wrapping XLR cables. I love moving amps into the car. Like I just love the lifestyle. Uh, it's just, I'm a, a lifer in that way. There's like, and you meet people like that, like Ian McKay, someone who I'd say like, finds a lot of joy in the admin side of being in a band. Yeah, I just like hard work. Like I love to like yeah. put the work in, and and I and I feel like the the part of punk that I identify with is just like I don't I don't never felt like anything was owed to me, and I always wanted to like put in the work, and I want I believed in like band karma and paying your dues, and like I feel like that's like a punk kind of spirit. It's like that type of mentality. I also find it interesting, like just in other interviews with you that I've I've read and stuff, that how you like from the graphics and the color schemes of your records, like you view the whole record, it seems like the project. Like it's never 
you know, like I wrote a bunch of songs, I'm going to put them together and that's going to be an album or it's time to do an album. Let's put it together. Like, it seems like there's a totality to what you're doing each time. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if it was always like that, but I think that you're always reaching to be thoughtful about all of the aspects that go into your work. And as you get better at navigating the sound of it, you realize like how important it is to upgrade the other parts of it too, be it the visuals, like the way that the album looks, the way the music videos looks, the way that the merch is, where you play on tour, who you bring on tour, what you wear even. Like I just tried to like extend thoughtfulness to all of um, the aspects that go into art and the way that you present it. But like even it seems like right down to the administration side of it, like there is like a, like do you view it as like, like this whole thing in in what you're doing is being like it's like it almost sounds like an auteur kind of approach to being in a band where the whole thing is is being in the band not just the music that you're producing well you're like kind of running a business so like you have to like i don't know uh i was like talking to so mount erie was like one of those people that i talked to and i like really respect him Uh, And I was like very shy in that interview. And I was like interested in, I was like, why don't you have a manager? Like, I think that's cool because I like the idea that like, if all, if everything goes to shit and no one cares about my band tomorrow, like I can do what you do and I can just scale it back and run it all myself and like mail packages from my house uh, to fans with little handwritten letters. Like I like that type of shit. But there's also this like, and I was kind of sad because I was like, why don't you ask me? <laughs> well, like he was saying like, I, he's like, there's, there's a lot of like systems at play when you're in a band, like for people to like get manip- manipulated by like this capitalist machine. And that like makes me uncomfortable. And if I always have tabs on everything, then that won't happen. You know, like he can control like playing uh, at venues that like, you know, don't take advantage of people or with bands that don't take advantage of people, he like can pay people well or whatever. And then the more hands that you have, or like the more people to manage things like that, the more it comes like out of your control. You can't keep tabs on the way that people are being treated or used like under your art. And I thought that was really fair and interesting and and valid and, and admirable. Um, but there is a part of me that's like kind of interested in like how far, how big we can get, you know what I mean? Like how far it can go. And like, I always want to have integrity artistically and I I always want to treat people fairly, but there is like a fascination with like, well, how big can we go with that in mind? Um, And so like you get to a point where it's like, I, I managed this band for a long time. I tour managed this band. I did the merch. I did all of the stuff. And then you get to like really appreciate and understand what someone's doing for you when they come on and sort of take it over. And you can definitely like just, you know, reach more and focus on the things that you really love to do, I guess, um, or are really good at uh, by sort of um, delegating those tasks to other people. Yeah, it's, it's funny, like when uh, Daryl Jennifer was on here, he talked about looking at Ian Mackay and like was saying that Ian Mackay and Fugazi they were content with being a local band and yeah, keeping yeah. it small. Totally. But with the bad, you know, but with the bad brains, they had to, they had to trade some of that control to, in order to try and achieve something greater. Like he was saying from his perspective, what the bad brains were trying to do was take this message as far as they could take that mm-hmm, message. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, it's really interesting. Like when you look at this trade off that has to come at a certain point, like, cause you can only do, so much on your own like before you have to start delegating or else you're just gonna it's gonna tear you apart yeah it's gonna take up all of your time like just you know i couldn't i can't imagine doing those things anymore on the scale that they've become uh but i do like take great comfort in knowing that if it's scaled back i would be i know how to do all that stuff like i i'm not it's not above it's not beneath me to to take that all on again you know yeah i don't know there's also like a fear like i think I've always had a fear that uh, in scaling up because I don't know if I'd be able to scale back. Right. No, that is totally, totally. I mean, that plateau is scary. Like, do you think that you can feel it? 
I mean, I, I, I honestly, like, I've been thinking about that a lot because, like, it really feels like I'm at the peak of my career right now. And I'm just like, I can't even enjoy it because I'm just like, oh, here comes the plateau and then the descent. Oh, no, you know? <laughs> tell, t- let me let me tell you from watching from the sidelines. You, you, <laughs> this is the beginning of, a, of another uh, ascent. But um, I but I, I, I definitely felt it. I know when the plateau happened for me. Yeah, I, I remember the day. Exactly. We were what in was it? Oh, my God. What was the day? Exactly. I've seen this happen to so many of my friends, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, I, we were in New Zealand. We were on tour with the Foo Fighters. We had, uh, I was on the cover. Oh my God. Wow. Yeah. I was like, this is it. This is the peak. And it was, it was. Wow. See, no, see, I knew, I know. (laughs) You know when it's coming, it's like the Sopranos. (laughs) But I, I think with you, it's definitely, I don't, don't worry. You're not, you're not in your Foo Fighters hotel. Wait, but then how do you, you're yet. like, this is the peak. And then when, when were you like, it's falling? Uh, I, well, I don't know. I think that's the other part of it. And like, that's what you're, you're talking about earlier about these musicians and this anxiety and how insecure a lot of these people come off when you meet them. It's because I think we are all constantly fearing what you're talking about. Like, yeah. You know, like I, I say that because that was probably ultimately the peak of my band, but I'd be lying if I said I didn't wake up dozens of times, including like the day we put out our first seven inch and be like, well, this is the plateau. We should just break up now. Cause like, <laughs> yeah. I don't want to have to deal with the descent. Yeah. 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 It just, I don't know. It just feels like that's part of what motivates people to create bands or to do music. The fear, fear of the descent. Fear of being irrelevant, yeah. fear of the descent. Yeah, you totally, know, like, totally. <laughs> like, why else would you put up with random strangers insulting us online? You know, it's just. Oh my god! Yeah, <laughs> it's true. This is what we have to deal with. Um, where did you kind of so eventually when you moved to Philadelphia? What is that scene like that that you're you're playing in? Oh man, it's so different from where I grew up. You know, it was like really tough. Um, like. You know, uh, it was interesting because like my like there was a real like there was like friction in like being this like softy indie gal <laughs> like in this band with like three dudes who were really who grew up on punk and ha- hardcore. And I think that that's like the sound of Little Big League. It's like a, a girl from the Pacific Northwest writing these kind of like sort of like indie pop songs and then like made harder but then we would also because we were in that scene it was like we would play with a lot of like punk and hardcore bands and we would all you know it would it would motivate me or it made me want to write like gnarlier songs just like harder songs and like push my like like yell more (laughs) or like we would sort of like we had these sort of popular songs and then like we would play in a on a bill with like harder bands or we play on a festival with like you know that was like more geared towards punk and hardcore and like have to make out a set that like didn't have those songs and like kind of we had certain songs that were you know closer to that and so it was so wild when I started Japanese breakfast it was the first time that I like I never had to do that anymore really I mean I still love to play like songs that have that energy there's something like really I love like I love like punk energy I love to really play a punk show and I miss it sometimes like I'm I I, especially because like Japanese breakfast has become like so I don't know like charming like it's like very like pop (laughs) part project and um wholesome uh is the word but I do miss like like the punk spirit of little big like I miss like house shows and like like just pushing on the guitar and you know and yelling would you be able, <laughs> would you be able to do like another thing at the same time or are you kind of like like obviously right now everything's pretty I imagine laser focused but like would you could you see yourself doing something that would allow you to kind of play that kind of stuff again or yeah like, maybe kind of I, I don't know like i i had this other band like right before japanese breakfast started that was called dog island that like was kind of like more in that direction and it felt it felt just like so great uh to play that and like releases a part of you but you know it takes work like i don't really know if i have the time because like i also just i really love my project and, and the things that i do and it's like you know taken off that it's hard to f- imagine like finding a time to like write punk music, you know, and, and playing that kind of band, but you know, never say never. But I yeah. do, I know I do miss that feelings, that type of performance. I don't do it anymore. 
Do you find at a certain point, like, you know, you mentioned Japanese breakfast has evolved to become this certain sort of thing. Do you feel there's like an expectation, you know, not, not even that you're like, you know, trying to tailor your art to, to people, but like, there's almost like an expectation or sort of like a, a duty to provide fans with a certain type of sound. Uh, no, but I will say that I think that the sound of Japanese breakfast is what comes most natural to me. And mm -hmm. to write songs like I like I was in Little Big League, I was I was kind of pushing a little bit outside of like my wheelhouse, I think. Um, and I still really liked those songs. I still loved like performing those songs. Um, but I think I was pushing for something harder in a way that like maybe wasn't as natural to me and, and might be part of the reason why that band didn't resonate with as many people but i don't know it's all speculation what was and what was the scene like that you you know you mentioned playing with some harder bands like philadelphia is such, <laughs> you know, it's, it's a tough town but like it's also like oh, a really high town yeah 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 um who are we playing with during this time i mean they're like not they're like a really small band it was a lot of emo band like the hotelier and foxing brought us out on tour i don't know if like you would consider them punks but like you know a lot of like the r5 guys uh were yeah. all in punk bands and like i was the r5 intern for a couple years and so like i feel like my relationship to punk is like really associated with those bands and like uh what's up, that would Garrett? be a, a, a an incredibly wild place to intern i can imagine uh was what of what r5 would be an amazingly wild place to intern I can oh imagine. i mean it was mostly just like sitting on a table like putting wristbands on people drinking like <laughs> beers it's <laughs> like it was the best uh and then i also like uh helped like sean agnew like basically like tweet from his apartment but um <laughs> <laughs> it's like the, no, it was, they felt really bad for me but i don't think they realized like i had applied for a grant uh like I was an unpaid intern and I just like helped run I helped like do shows and stuff like that but um I think they felt bad for me but I, they, I like had applied for a grant so like I was like covered by the school like um so I I, I was just like I, I just got to go to free shows you know yeah uh, yeah and no, it's really fun I love Sean Agnew if there was going to be a movie made about anyone in the music industry, oh, that's the person to make the movie oh about. totally 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 I love that guy and I'm I like owe so much to him and like you know knowing it, like being involved in the music scene in philly at all to to him for sure yeah you know he definitely um you know and, and like once again that's something that like you mentioned like that does r5 does kind of come right at a punk and you know eventually they're you know still doing the punk shows but they're also doing like huge shows right. and that you know there, there are articles written about him in the new york times like during that whole bright eyes versus clear channel stuff oh shit i didn't hear about that yeah, like I remember they were like, I remember Sean Agnew being interviewed because they were like the, you know, an independent promotion kind of standing up in the face of like Clear Channel at the time when everything was going sort of clear. Wait, how was Bright Eyes involved? Did Was Bright Eyes playing a Clear Channel show? Like, Bright Eyes, no, his whole thing was that he wouldn't do oh, anything. That's cool. Clear yeah, that's so sick. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I feel like I, I, I would like to say that like that's, you know, I do try to like avoid certain venues <laughs> and promoters like i definitely i like you know uh i feel like the all ages shows and like the local promoters um i feel like my relationship to those people is like strengthened because of like my work with r5 and those mm -hmm. guys and and the importance of that and also just like there was such a like i feel like i grew up with that group you know i was like in college but like you know they were all like so <laughs> these like curmudgeonly like <laughs> punks that were just basically like you're on, you aren't shit like um what greg daly curmudgeonly oh you're yeah kidding me. oh oh man greg <laughs> daly i think he just got married um but uh, he did yeah but yeah i mean i, I like it and instilled so, like s something in me for sure that was just like you're nothing if you can play like a 500 cap room in philly but like you're something if you can draw like 200 people in like um like middle of nowhere ohio or something just like stuff <laughs> like that i i like appreciate and i feel like hardened hardened me in a good way yeah like it, it's definitely i don't know i find like like you mentioned off the top like you know being in a diy band you kind of have to grow a, a little bit of an appreciation for the work involved in being in a band and you can when you go on tour and you meet these bands you can tell who kind of has that background 
in definitely, their music career. Definitely, definitely. And that I feel like is a really important part for me personally. That people know that about my narrative is like none of this came easily. And I like I truly like need people to know that like I have been working in this industry for like a really long time. Almost almost, oh, yeah. over, almost 15 years, you know. Yeah, well, that's why it's such an amazing thing to kind of watch happen this year, because it is something that feels like you built, you know, like you you worked for this over a long time, kind of building on top of each success. Yeah, I fucking deserve it. <laughs> yeah, well, t- well, take it, you know, like you wrote you got like a, a, a massive record and a massive book in the same year. That's like pretty impressive. <laughs> Thank you. I, I It's pretty surreal. It's. I also did want to talk to you briefly because um, once again, I heard you mention before the idea of grief motivating creativity. Um, I read an interview where you where that was part of the conversation, and um, I found when I lost my mom, it was the exact opposite. Mm. You know, I found I found I couldn't. You know, really, you know, I only lost her about two years ago now, but it really took to this year before I was able to kind of write about anything else or even write about that from any sort of perspective other than just being hurt and so i just i don't know i found it really interesting that you found the opposite kind of experience coming out of grief yeah i mean it sounds pretty troublesome to say grief is a motivator i think that maybe what i meant by that was like i didn't sorry i mean i I should i shouldn't have used no no no, it's fine no no i uh I think I know what you mean. I'm sure that like I had a conversation that was sort of like that, but um, I think for me, I felt like so close to death that I just felt, you know, like my mom and my aunt both died of GI cancers. And I was like with my mom, like for the six months that she was dying, I felt like all of a sudden I was really afraid of death in this very new way that I just felt like very aware of how limited of time that I had uh, and how much I wanted to say. And I think that in some ways that like lit some type of fire in me to want to create what I wanted to create before it was too late. Um, I did start writing pretty soon after she died because I felt, I've always been like such an open book and a really outspoken person. And I was really surprised that I I was so quiet. Like I just was in shock and I had nothing to say and nothing to share. And I was just really confused. And I feel like writing Psychopomp was just like an anchor of just like, I don't, I need like, I don't, this is is kind of how I feel, you know? or to just like let go of like stuff I couldn't say out loud in a way. Uh, and it was also just like such a suffocating time that I just like needed to carve out a space for myself. Like I was living in Eugene with my dad who was just like losing it, you know, he just like really melted down. And I was like in my parents' house, like in my mom's house, like getting rid of her shit for like six months. And I was just like, I just need to like go into this like little shed at the bottom of the property and like unload a little bit. Cause like, this is like some dark shit. Um, So I feel like I, I just like needed it in this specific way, but you know, I had nothing at that time. Like, whereas you like had you know, your, maybe your family, you had responsibilities. I had, I had no responsibility, you know, like I was just like alone in the world. Yeah. I think I retreated into it. Like I really left a lot of it fall on my brother's shoulder. Like you mentioned cleaning out your mom's stuff. And that was, that did me in like trying to clean out my mom's stuff and just like, you know, and it really, you know, made me kind of come back. And as you could probably see from when we had the cameras on before the interview, it hasn't really started yet, but it has motivated me to try and get rid of some of my stuff. Cause, uh, um, oh, yeah, that's I have like so much such a stuff. big thing. Yeah. Like just all these collections that mean a lot to me that eventually just bring hurt, you know, like from having to deal with my oh, mom's yeah. collection. Uh, yeah. You know, totally, totally. I think about that all the time. Yeah. Like you're never going to sell that stuff for the maximum value. Like I'm looking at these records as being this valuable thing. <laughs> and having to think about my kids, you know, having to get rid of, yeah. Oh, God. Oh, yeah. My, yeah. Oh, tears my heart out. But it's, it really, 
I don't know. I, I gained a lot of, uh, I gained, I think I gained a lot of empathy for and sympathy for musicians that lose parents or artists that lose parents and how that changes their work, you know, and not negatively, but just like you just, cause it was so immense yeah. feeling it myself. Yeah. Um, and I think that's why your, your, your work, you know, recent stuff is, you know, like the, it just hits really hard because it's, it's, it is so raw like that. And you're, you are being so open with it. Well, thank you. Have you written since then? I started, I wrote one song about my mom dying uh, a year ago. And then now I'm writing <laughs> again for the first time. And yeah. It was kind of, the, it was losing my mom. And then I think the pandemic hitting and just oh, feeling yeah. like, the one what the fuck am I going to write about? <laughs> right. Right. You're like really sitting in it. Yeah. Yeah. I think it was sitting in it and just, uh, but it must be oh, hard to like be a dad, you know? Cause like oh. you've like crossed over to this like sort of new side. And so like, you can't, there's part of you like when you lose your parent, you're just like, I'm a baby. <laughs> like, you know, yes. like yes. I'm a baby without a mom. <laughs> like, but to be a dad yeah. when that happens, it's like confusing, you know, because you're like, I can't, I can't just be a baby and like fall down. Like I, I have I'm a dad. <laughs> like I have to like it, not do that. It's amazing how unable I was to do that. You yeah, know, I still yeah. found myself becoming a baby at times just because, yeah, like it just I don't know. It's like this weird thing because I think we all prepare for it our whole, at least I Oh, I felt totally. Like I yeah. Yeah. But you can't prepare for it. Right. Mm -hmm. Like at all. And yeah. And I think the, you know, now I, I think like you're saying, I had the kids so I could retreat into the kids and probably not deal with it in the way I should have been dealing with it right afterwards, because, you know, you have to kind of keep making waffles and pretending like, no. you know, everything's <laughs> just fine. It's, oh my god it's heavy i'm sorry i don't <laughs> get so down on this whole thing it's normally way lighter i promise it's normally <laughs> we, we're just ch chatting about music and going from there. <laughs> um uh this has been a, a really incredible conversation to get to have with you and anytime you want to come back and talk about music please know michelle that the door is always open oh, here. thank you so much for having me I, I really appreciate it i'm such a fan and i'm really grateful that uh i got to talk to you thank you michelle for coming on the show when you heard right there michelle will be back at some point down the line uh, when we want to talk more music or talk more R5 adventures uh, R5 you know they did the live turn out of punk in Philadelphia show members of R5 were guests on that show so you know a strong kinship there with my my friends out there and congratulations to Greg Get Daily as well on uh, on on the wedding that's you know fantastic uh, I think uh, did I have any other notes off the top I don't think I think I don't think I really did Oh, also, you know, I might have, in retrospect, I, I might have mischaracterized the Ian Mackay thing that Daryl Jennifer said, but check out Daryl Jennifer's episode of Turned Out of Punk because he does make a very interesting point about just the different perspectives of uh, Ian and Fugazi and my, I guess Minor Threat as well and, and the Bad Brains. But anyway, check out that episode to kind of get the, the exact, you know, articulation of the whole thing. Uh, okay, that is it for today's show. Uh, thank you, everyone, for listening as well. Coming up later on this week, uh, th I think this might be, after the Bill Hader episode, the longest episode ever. It actually might be longer than the Bill Hader episode. I haven't started editing this thing down yet, so I don't know what it's going to come out like. Uh, but coming up on the show... If you have not heard of this person, you are in for a mind-blowing experience. But for many, many people, this will be a huge deal. Coming up on the show later on this week, Edmund McMillan will be here. He is the uh, inventor of, creator of, uh, overseer of, uh, you know, I get the terminology a lot better on the episode. I have my mind blown on this episode. I learned so much shit of the video games Super Meat Boy and The Binding of Isaac and dozens, hundreds of other games before that and as well as a 
brand new board game adaptation of The Binding of Isaac called The Binding of Isaac Four Souls. You can find out more information at foursoulsspoiler.com. And this thing has a Kickstarter that uh, it, it's just, it's, it's blown my mind. It's completely dwarfed things, everything I've worked on. The budget for this board game is way higher than the budget of The Wrestlers. I'll tell you that much. Uh, this thing is incredible, and this episode will will blow your mind. He is a very inspiring person, and uh, yeah, it connects back to punk. You know, it always seems to do that. Um, I'm, you know, I'm very excited for you to hear this one. As you can hear, I'm very, very excited for you to check this one out. Uh, and that is it. Remember, as always, Black Lives Matter. The lives of Indigenous people matter. We need to protect trans kids, and we need to help trans people protect themselves. Uh, we need to stop hate and violence towards Asian people, and we need to stop just violence and just and just hate towards people of different faiths as well. This shit is not politics. This is not political stuff. This is basic human rights shit. This is like really just people trying to be free and just trying to exist. Uh, go out now, get yourself informed, read up on things, get get involved. You know. Donate your time. If you got money, there's a lot of organizations that could really use it all around the world. All around the world, there's shit to look into that's happening. Um, uh, you could also, uh, uh, you know, um, just just smash fascism. Just, you know, fuck Nazis. Fuck all that shit. You know, well, there's no room for that stuff. You know, there's never been room for that stuff. Ever. Uh, go out there and make your own culture. It might help you feel better, you know, you know, you, you got to start a band, start a fanzine, start a podcast. Anyone can start a podcast. Everyone starts a podcast, uh, but you can do something else. There's lots of other stuff to do, too. You can start a podcast, too, obviously. But there's lots of other stuff to do, too, um, you know, and you just draw a picture, you know, uh, try to meditate maybe once or twice. See if it works. I didn't believe it would work and it worked. And then, you know, maybe it'll work for you. I'm I'm not telling you what to do, you know. I'm just saying that maybe try it, you know, just maybe. Uh, but sign your organ donor cards because that shit is like, you know, you don't even need to try that. You just need to sign it and then that's, and forget it. Like set it and forget it, sign it and forget it. And then they come looking for your organs. You don't need them anymore. And someone else's life can be changed forever. And the ripple effects are massive. So I'm speaking from, you know, family experience when I say that. So please, please sign your organ donor cards. Um, uh, wear a mask, you know, still, there's still reasons to wear it. You know, you look at this stuff, it's still, it's still good to wear it, you know, might as well. Maybe, maybe there's safe ways to do it. I don't know. We'll figure out this playing shows again <laughs> soon. Oh man. You know, I, I'm excited. It's going to be weird, but I'm excited. Uh, that's it. I don't think I have anything else to say. Uh, and uh, yeah, um, I'll see you next episode. It's a doozy. Bye.